Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium. It's Tuesday, October 20th, uh, 10, 20, 2020. And uh, I'm excited to once again invite uh, a speaker from Washington State University to join us this week. Before introducing her, I have uh, a couple of programs uh, this week and next to tell you about as part of our continuing series of the Renfrew Colloquium. This week, we will have a special Thursday Colloquium uh, our friends from the Lionel Hampton School of Music, uh, Leonard Garrison, Christopher Fund, and Miranda Wilson, will be giving a preview to this year's University of Idaho Bach Festival. Uh, that will be Thursday the 22nd, 1230 to 130, regular time slot, just a different day, using the regular Zoom login for the colloquium. Uh, so hope that uh, you'll be able to attend that as well. And uh, also um, next Tuesday, uh, the 27th, uh, we will have a presentation by a former University of Idaho faculty member. Uh, that's Daniela McKehey, uh, who is now at Texas Tech University. And she'll be uh, giving a reprise of a program she gave this summer for the Idaho Humanities Council Exploration, Science, and Celebrity, Edmund Hillary and the Commonwealth Trans-Antarctic Expedition. Uh, so I hope you'll tune in. Uh, several of you I know uh, were acquainted with Daniela when she was here at the U of I, and she's graciously ag agreed to zoom in from Texas for this presentation. Today, we will hear from Professor Noriko Kawamura from Washington State University, uh, a program titled To Transnationalize War, Memory for Peace, the Reconciliation of Pearl Harbor and Hiroshima. This was originally intended to be part of this year's Bora Symposium, and we're happy that uh, uh, Noriko is able to do it uh, now as we uh, continue to observe the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Uh, this year, uh, though, uh, the University of Idaho is uh, featuring a special exhibit of uh, memories that uh, include some artifacts uh, from the University of Hiroshima in Japan. And uh, before we turn to Dr. Kawamura's talk, I'd like to invite uh, Courtney Berg from the library's Department of Special Collections uh, to tell us just a little bit about that exhibit. So Courtney. Uh, so over a year ago, we were contacted by Bill Smith at the Martin Institute because he had received prior some, a shipment from Hiroshima University mm -hmm. and it contained some uh, roof tiles that had been blown off of buildings during the bombing of Hiroshima in 1945, as well as the manga series Barefoot Gen and copies of letters between Hiroshima University and the University of Idaho from the 1950s. And all of this led to us doing the exhibit Growing from Ground Zero, which is on display right now at the library, which is kind of looking back at what happened at, after the bombing of Hiroshima and also the interactions between the two universities that took place in the 50s. So in 1951, uh, the president, then president of Hiroshima University, Tatsuo Morito, sent a letter to institutions across the world asking for a small donation in their efforts to rebuild the university, particularly some seeds to plant on their campus and a book for their library. The University of Idaho president forwarded the letter that the U of I received to the College of Forestry where Professor Merrill Dieters uh, responded sending seeds from two pine trees, the western, white, the western pine and the white pine, as well as a book for the library, but also $3. So if those seeds didn't grow in Japan, they could buy a tree that would uh, greenify their campus. 
So after 70 years, students at Hiroshima University sent thank yous to the institutions that did contribute to that, us being one, uh, with that package of roof tiles. Uh, it was their desire that those who died in the bombing not be forgotten and remembered in such a way to promote peace for the future. Uh, and if you haven't had an opportunity to visit the exhibit, it's currently on display in the second floor of the library throughout the rest of this month. Um, and, but if you're unable to visit the library, there is a short video tour available at the University of Idaho Library's YouTube channel. Thank you very much, Courtney. And uh, 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 you'll see in the chat that there is a link uh, to the YouTube video, uh, the tour of the exhibit. So uh, we uh, appreciate that. And uh, now I would uh, like to uh, introduce our main speaker for today. Uh, Professor Kawamura is uh, the Arnold and Tsuko Kraft Professor in the Department of History at Washington State University. Uh, her research focuses on the history of war, peace, and diplomacy in the Pacific world. She teaches courses in the history of US foreign relations, US military history, World War II in the Pacific and the Cold War. Um, she has a number of publications and uh, has a, a book that uh, will be coming out uh, uh, later this year uh, called Emperor Hirohito's Cold War, uh, which is under contract with the University of Washington Press. And I encourage you to visit her website to look at her publications and uh, learn a little bit more about her background. Uh, but today, she's going to help us understand uh, how remembering World War II in the Pacific is divided by national boundaries and uh, the contrast between the way Americans and Japanese remember the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the use of atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to uh, some cross-border, uh, cross-boundary, cross-Pacific insights. Uh, so uh, welcome, Professor Kawamura, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bird, uh, for inviting me to the curriculum. And I would like to thank uh, um, Julissa, Donnie, Courtney, Bird, and uh, Dr. Bill Smith, uh, originally, for inviting me to a talk uh, related to the Hiroshima exhibit at the University of Idaho Library. And uh, today's talk, can I share my PowerPoint, which I just can't share it with you. Um, the host disabled the participant screen share. Can I share my PowerPoint with the audience? Uh, try it now. Thank you. Oops. Mm. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So now I hope you see the screen. Yes. And the, we some can. of you. Yeah. Well, thanks for the introduction about the, my big title. Some of you may be wondering why I am using such a big title uh, for the topic, uh, uh, today's uh, talk, and uh, uh, I added the kusei, that's a Japanese word, uh, to live uh, together peacefully. And actually, uh, this, uh, uh, I wrote a chapter with this title uh, uh, as part of the uh, sort of a partnership of a joint research between WHU and the uh, International Christian University in Tokyo over 10 years ago. And uh, uh, because of the 75th anniversary, I thought maybe it may be a good idea to revisit this talk in relation to Hiroshima. Today, I would like to focus more on Hiroshima and atomic bomb, not so much on Pearl Harbor, but I would just uh, like to use war memory as a way to promote peace and uh, uh, reconciliation. Um, 
So uh, in the occasion of the 275th anniversary of the end of World War II, um, he, historians like us, um, you know, use this as a good occasion to uh, sort of uh, reevaluate the state of uh, the field of World War II in his, you know, a World War II history. And uh, World War memories matter uh, to even historians like us who are more preoccupied with the, what happened and why happened. Uh, but historians' words like this uh, from Japanese historian Daizaburo Yui, a struggle to defend peace is a struggle against the lapse of memory. And there, historians can play some role. Uh, and then, of course, it echoes a philosopher like George Santa Anna, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. However, war memory is a unique interdisciplinary field, and it lies outside of my comfort zone. Um, but studying uh, World War II history, it's not too difficult to talk about the importance of the need to transnationalize war memory by using Pacific War as a case study. I have been constantly reminded of the limitations and problems uh, of a nation state based approach to study the war across the Pacific. And I see how national narratives of World War II have been influencing how the public memory about this war. Positional differences between the United States and Japan, that is as a victim and uh, a victimizer, have made it challenging to promote reconciliation at both political and official and individual levels. How Americans and Japanese peoples remember the Pacific War as a Pacific War are very different, especially on the events of Japan's attacks on Pearl Harbor and American decision to use atomic bombs over Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Those two events continue to be controversial on both sides of the Pacific. In the public memory of the United States, Pearl Harbor attack and uh, dropping of the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki are almost inseparable. And both are remembered as the most important turning points in the 20th century history. For example, in 1999, when the 20th century was about to come to an end, a mush museum of the news media in Virginia, known as Museum, took on a poll among 67 prominent American journalists and asked them to rank the top 100 stories uh, in the 20th century. Probably it's no surprise, the atomic bombs used against Japan received the first place out of 100 events, and the Pearl Harbor attack came in the third. In the US national collective memory, an American uh, patriotic triumphal heroic narrative of World War II dominates. A righteous de democracy, the United States was drawn into the war by Japan's surprise attack. And the US was resolved to fight a quote unquote, a good war and defeat the treacherous enemy until it achieved the unconditional surrender of the enemy. The United States used the atomic bombs to end the war as quickly as possible to save lives. In this narrative, the atomic bomb was a legitimate weapon that had been used for a just cause. This good war narrative 
still uh, dominates American public memory. The Enola Gay controversy at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in 1995 demonstrated this point. In commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, the museum planned to display the Enora Gay, the B-29 bomber that dropped the Iranian atomic bomb over Hiroshima. The origin, original plan was to use the aircraft as the exhibition's central icon to examine not only the bomb's creation under the Manhattan Project, but also uh, the ground level effects of atomic weaponry and its historical implications. However, exhibition was abandoned because of emotionally charged protests by military organizations, veterans lobbying um, groups, and the conservative politicians. These protesters did not want to display images from Ground Zero in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which could remind the visitors that hundreds of thousands of men, women, children, mostly civilians, were incinerated and irradiated by the blasts. Historian John Dower puts it well. The opponents of Smithsonian's original exhibition plan wanted to defend a heroic or triumphal narrative and justify the use of the atomic bomb because it ended the war and saved American lives. However, this American narrative ends when the atomic bombs hit ground zero. The opponents of the exhibition did not want to show objects from ground zero, such as a lunchbox containing carbonized rice and peas that have belonged to a seventh grade schoolgirl whose corpse was never found. Because they were afraid for the viewers that what the Enola gay symbolized would be overshadowed by the school girls' lunchbox. This military veterans and conservative politicians uh, um, accusation uh, that, uh, that was quite common uh, about Smithsonian curators included the words such as uh, unpatriotic and anti-American. For example, a congressman from Massachusetts public, publicly stated that, quote, I don't want 16 year olds walking out of that museum thinking badly about the United States. A representative of the American Legion testifying in front of the Senate Committee on Rules and the administration said, quote, we believe in passing a sense of America's unique role in world history and the sense of its greatness onto future generations. Hence, he was against showing the ground zero in Hiroshima. Japan's uh, war memory uh, of the war is very different from uh, that of Americans. Japanese people's memory of the Asia Pacific War, that is the wars they, wars that the, their country fought in China, Southeast Asia and the Pacific for 15 years, has been heavily influenced by their own circumstances, their own experiences in the war. And experiences vary between soldiers and civilians overseas and in the home front. The overwhelming majority of uh, Japanese remember the Pacific War as a wrong war. But there is no real national memory of the war because their memories 
are so different based on their experiences. However, as the rest of the world often points out, the most serious problem with Japan's memory of the war is the failure of the Japanese government as well as the Japanese people to accept full responsibility for what their military did during the war overseas. The post-war generations have been grown up with what critics call sanitized history textbooks that largely reflect the so-called Tokyo war crimes trial view of history, which blends the military, ultra-nationalists, and the Zaibatsu, that those are the industrial and financial conglomerates, for the reckless and aggressive war that Japan raised. These generations have learned the history of the Pacific War as victim's history in the passive voice. In other words, the China incident was caused without saying by whom. Pearl Harbor was bombed without saying why. An atomic bomb was dropped without saying why as the natural disasters had struck Japan. Japanese people largely suffer from what people usually call higaisha ishiki or victim consciousness about the war. Japanese people as victims of militarism and uh, oppression by the military and sacrifices and starvation and deprivation during the war. Then the Japanese people talk about massive air raids by the United States, bombers. And then finally, the atomic bomb occupy a central place in their victim consciousness. The trauma of nuclear devastation and the unconditional surrender, and then US occupation and war crimes trials, all these reinforce the Japanese people's peculiar vulnerability and the victimization. The problem with this sense of victimization is that Japanese people remember the details of what happened under the mushroom cloud, but do not think about why it happened. The tragedies of Hiroshima and Nagasaki became icons of Japan's suffering and they allowed Japanese memory of the war to fixate on what happened to Japan and also allowed to blot out recollection of the Japanese victimization of others. They do not look back and think critically about the consequences of the conduct of the Japanese empire and its military. However, the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the victims of the atomic bombs, are trying to promote a dual identity as a perpetrator and a victim simultaneously. They argue that Hiroshima and Nagasaki's voice against nuclear weapons and their appeal for pacifism and humanitarianism would never become a universal voice unless they recognize their existence as aggressors and victims of the Pacific War. What the Japanese question about the atomic bomb is, is the morality and the legitimacy of the atomic bomb. As the mayor of Hiroshima said, quote, we cannot and will not deny Japan's aggression that Japan did evil, but that does not justify an atomic bomb. It is too cruel, it is inhumane to argue that anything justifies nuclear weapons. So this became the basis for the anti-nuclear movement and uh, 
basically they take the position that nuclear weapons should be banned as illegal weapons throughout the world. But anyway, going back to the question of the use of atomic bomb, while the US national memory of the subject stops when the atomic bombs hit ground zero, Japan's national memory of the atomic bombs begins when they hit the ground zero. So in international wars, so long as war memories are shaped as national memories within confined national boundaries, neither the US justification for the use of the war, the atomic bomb, nor Japan's anti-nuclear appeals will be unable to persuade the rest of the world. So the question is, is it possible for former enemies to reconcile their opposing memories of the war? My simple answer as a historian is that in order for peoples of Japan, the US, and other Asian countries to share a common memory of the Asia Pacific War for, for possibly for reconciliation, reconciliation. Historical narratives of the war must be written not as a national history, but as a transnational history, or at least try to incorporate a transnational perspective and outside in looks into a national history. In my opinion, peace cannot be preserved unless people somehow stop treating the concepts of nationalism and transnationalism as mutually exclusive dichotomous ideas. We need to seek a vision for nationalism that considers freedom of speech and self-criticism to be a source of strength. A healthy nationalism in the 21st century must be self-reflective, open-minded, and uh, inclusive, and must embrace the element of transnationalism that value pluralistic views of the world and understand perspectives of others. And recently, we do have some positive uh, development. Um, President Barack Obama became the first US president to visit Hiroshima. And uh, he um, offered with, and uh, he is uh, Prime Minister of Japan Abe and President Obama. And um, I would like to call your attention to this photo. This is one of the two rare photos that was taken on the day that the Hiroshima uh, was uh, attacked by atomic bomb. And the, the young man sitting here, I hope you can see it, is this old man who was embraced by President Obama. And this sort of image certainly uh, so is a moment of uh, reconciliation or healing. And national leaders can make a difference in uh, public memory of uh, each country. And uh, in the same year, 2016, uh, Prime Minister of Japan Abe visited the uh, Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor. Uh, here is the image and greeted and embraced the uh, survivors of Pearl Harbor attack back in 1961. So um, I think uh, that, uh, yeah, certainly public uh, memory and collective uh, thoughts are hard to change. It takes a lot of efforts to um, cross national boundaries. 
and achieve reconciliation. However, I think at individual levels, we can try to change our approach to war memory more easily uh, by individuals uh, conscious efforts to select what to remember and what to forget. A memory is more easily transnationalized at the individual level, I hope, because individual experiences can expand into a transnational dimension more easily than can state experiences. Personal stories of war victims are so powerful because uh, when we focus our imaginations on the suffering of individuals, their national, I'm sorry, their nationality seems far less important than their plight in the context of a common humanity. War museums and uh, exhibitions, such as the one in the University of Idaho going on currently, are great vehicles to encourage this sort of effort. The, they provide opportunities for us to choose to remember or choose to forget. In the rest of the talk today, I would like to share some of what I remember from my visit to Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. It was a, a, about a year ago. Um, when you go to Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, on the first floor, you see this panoramic view of the devastation of uh, the city of Hiroshima near Ground Zero. And um, the, the first thing that uh, uh, struck me was uh, these two photos taken on the day uh, of the uh, uh, atomic bomb over Hiroshima. And this is the one that I shared with you earlier at the time of President Obama's visit to Hiroshima. And this is the other one. And, and, and I'm sorry about the quality of photos. I took those photos of photos. And um, uh, you can see the chaos, confusion, people wondering, hurt, or some were already dead, but they had no idea what happened to them. And uh, you can see the black rain kind of pouring over them. Sorry about some images, I should have warned you. Uh, the, these are the, again, images I cannot forget. Um, the, 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 the horror of atomic bomb or nuclear weapons in, in, in generally is not only the powerful blast and the high heat, but uh, uh, the radiation sickness, the horror. And uh, uh, these are the images of the people who suffered from uh, radiation. And this uh, young man uh, died within two weeks, but before that he developed uh, internal bleeding and um, um, all those uh, blood spots developing bleeding gum and losing teeth and so forth. He died within two weeks of the blast. The girl, 12 year old girl, she uh, was crushed by the collapsed, collapsed, collapsed house and she suffered from radiation, but also she suffered from wound and uh, she was uh, uh, infected and infested with maggots because there was no treatment to be done. And uh, she was losing hair and that was, uh, something I could not forget. Um, that's one of the symptoms of uh, radiation sickness. She died in, on November 3rd. And um, 
these are some other images that stay with me. Um, the atomic bomb produced extensive high heat as high as 5400 degree Fahrenheit. And so near the ground zero, uh, the people and anything living there evaporated instantaneously and there is only shadow left on the concrete and stone. And this Buddha, bronze Buddha statue melted with the high heat and the blast. Uh, this is just a, some of the images of the ground zero. And the famous schoolgirls uh, lunchbox that John Dower talked about. Those are the uh, exhibits that uh, Hiroshima sent to uh, Washington DC, but uh, eventually they were not able to show in the Smithsonian institutions in all of the exhibition. Um, this map actually, yeah, was another thing that really caught my attention. Um, I teach US military history at WSU and World War II history as well. And there are so many things to uh, learn for myself and to teach, but the, I never really uh, learned about this until I visited the Hiroshima uh, Peace uh, Museum. Um, this map shows uh, the military is uh, planning how to uh, practice you know, dropping atomic bomb and also actual sites. Uh, they chose uh, Hiroshima, Kokura, and Nagasaki, then Niigata in that order. And uh, in order to uh, find out the uh, full extent of the impact of blast, uh, the U.S. Uh, strategic bombing uh, did not choose these sites to be bombed uh, with conventional fire bomb bombs. Uh, and, uh, but then they needed to practice uh, dropping atomic bombs. So they used uh, uh, kind of practice bombing, yeah, known as pumpkins. Uh, and they practiced 40 in 49 cities. Those cities uh, you know, suffered from uh, atomic bomb practice bombs known as pumpkins. And uh, those are just conventional fire bombs. And about uh, 1,600 people died as a result. But those practices happened between July 20th and August 14th. And, uh, you know, it was uh, in, right in the middle of the Potsdam Declaration ultimatum to force Japan to surrender, otherwise they'll, they'll take the uh, consequence that is utter destruction. Uh, so while they were doing that diplomatic maneuvering, uh, military was ready to drop the atomic bombs. And that kind of told me about how military thought about the use of atomic bombs. And um, another thing about this is uh, Hiroshima was, of course, the first site, and it happened August 9th. And then three days later, August, uh, uh, on, on Hiroshima, August 6th, I'm sorry. And then the third, three days later, the second target was actually Kokura in northern Kyushu, right there. However, uh, when uh, the plane was ready to drop, the kukura was covered with a thick cloud and they were ordered to drop the bomb vigil, by vigil, not using radar. So they could not drop the atomic bomb over kukura. So they moved to the third target and uh, Nagasaki was also covered with cloud, but at the last minute, clouds started to uh, disappear and uh, so Nagasaki became the second site. And so this sort of like the issue of contingency, uh, the weather condition uh, 
decided the fate of people in Kukura and Nagasaki. And that sort of reminds uh, us of the nature of a, a atomic bomb and uh, you know human decisions behind it uh, and uh, so forth. Um, so if the atomic bomb was not going to be uh, dropped over Nagasaki, the pilots were actually instructed to uh, do something about it because they, meaning like dropping on the ocean or something, because the plane did not have enough fuel to carry it back to Tainian Island. And that also again was it's like an issue of contingency that kind of gives me a chilling feel. Um, so this uh, image, uh, if you go to Hiroshima Peace Park, uh, there is that famous uh, uh, Genbaku Dome, or yeah, it's Genbaku Dome here. And this became the really the uh, symbol of atomic bomb. And uh, they try to preserve it, but when you actually go there, you can see in close up the the whole the building is collapsing and uh, they are working so hard to keep it standing and if you go to the back you know if you take the bus and then go to the entrance of Genbak Dome you can see the uh, the concrete structure to to keep the uh, other side standing so that uh, uh, they can have that uh, image like when Emperor Hirohito visited Hiroshima back in 1947, the building was standing up there, but uh, without efforts to keep it standing, it's going to fall apart. It's part of historic preservation, that is to create a memory and uh, so that people can remember. I thought that was interesting, but I didn't think about all those things unless I visited uh, Hiroshima and uh, I hope uh, after corona, corona, coronavirus pandemic uh, comes to an end, if it ever does, uh, I hope people can uh, travel uh, to visit the site. Um, so that, that's almost all of my images I wanted to share with the um, audience today about the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum that I uh, went last year. But just about the talk, about, you know, since Emperor Hirohito is here, and I'm writing a book about it, which is very slow in coming, but uh, um, so Emperor Hirohito did visit Hiroshima in 1947 and 1949, Nagasaki. Um, he, yeah, well, probably the subject of uh, uh, his war memory or his uh, uh, failure to take full responsibility for war, and that's a controversy, maybe a subject of another day, but just to end my talk, I would like to share this. Uh, Emperor Hirohito did visit the United States twice after uh, World War II, uh, first in 1971, but that was only to stop by in Alaska on the way back from uh, his visit to Europe. Uh, but 1975 visit to US was to really uh, you know, travel throughout the United States and he uh, actually went to the uh, Arlington National Cemetery uh, and then he, uh, here is his image. Um, on the way back, he did go to uh, Pearl Harbor uh, Air Force Base, but he was not able to uh, go to the uh, Arizona Memorial. Uh, and it was not really 
uh, publicized uh, either. I just could not find any image of him in uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. But his thoughts were there. And he actually, we know for a fact that he wanted to make a public uh, uh, you know, apology, but that wasn't uh, allowed for political reasons of the Japanese government. Um, so, okay, I should just stop, share. Um, oops, oh, sorry, I was gonna do this. Um, I think that's all for today, and uh, I, I will be happy to discuss some of the issues with the audience or take questions. Thank you very much for this informative presentation. I learned some things that I didn't know before uh, uh, about uh, World War II and especially uh, Hiroshima. Um, we have a, a comment and then a question from Robert in the chat, uh, and I'll just go ahead and read it and then you can uh, respond. In 2015, Congress created the Manhattan Project National Historic Park, a unit of which is in the Tri-Cities, the Hanford unit, which created the material for the bomb of Nagasaki. Uh, this park is effectively charged with permanently displaying the themes that you mentioned in your discussion of the Enola Gay exhibit. Uh, so Robert asks, in our hyper-partisan times, how can local communities on both sides of this issue come together towards a transnational interpretation? And what role can your work and the work of other historians play in shaping that interpretation? So I, I hope, hope you got all that. So uh, the role of local communities uh, to promote a dialogue and the work of you and other historians. Yeah, okay, thank you for the information and the comment and uh, thank you for the question. That's a good question that I've been thinking uh, about for a long time. Um, as a historian, I, I, mean, I just can tell, speak only for myself about being a historian of World War II. Um, I, I just try to uh, share the stories of the other side of the war, for both sides actually, and in my part, because of my Japanese background and the ability to use uh, uh, Japanese sources, I wrote a book on Emperor Hirohito and the Pacific War uh, to share with the American audience. Um, I usually teach U.S. history, but I just wanted to add, add more about Japan. Well, I was able to do it, so I wrote about the uh, uh, outside in look of uh, um, you know, World War II through the lens of Emperor Hirohito. And so that's the sort of thing historians can do. I'm at least trying to do in my modest way, the transnationalizing the uh, war subjects even though writing it as a you know, story of a nation, still you can use transnational or uh, cross-cultural sort of perspective to look at the, the subject. And uh, so that uh, we can arrive at the more accurate information from both perspectives. Um, at the local level, actually, Hanford did have a lot of uh, attention from uh, Hiroshima uh, Peace Memorial Museum. And about 10 years ago, um, I think it was 60th anniversary, um, no, 65 65th anniversary of the, the end of World War II. Actually, the Hiroshima Museum contacted me so that they could show, do an exhibition of, uh, of the photos, the images of the Ground Zero in Hiroshima. And they wanted to show that in uh, WSU Tri-Cities campus because there are victims of uh, uh, the nuclear plant in uh, Tri-Cities, a harmful area, harmful times. So uh, they, they wanted to basically share the, uh, you know, 
sensible that, uh, that we all lose in uh, developing nuclear weapons or atomic bombs. And so they wanted to kind of reach out to the people in the tri city area. And uh, so we did that at the uh, tri cities campus at the WSU. And of course, we brought those exhibits to WSU library as well. And um, so we can do that sort of thing, like showing images or doing exhibits or organizing that sort of thing. And uh, um, because we, we all have to worry about the consequences of dangerous weapons. And uh, I don't know whether I answered uh, Robert's question. Are there any more? Maybe Robert, you can share. Any other thoughts? Oh, I um, just you know thank you for thank you for addressing the question. I um, I, I work a lot with the Park Service and kind of trying to move forward to to bring additional perspectives to this issue. Um, and the the Park Service is doing a good job, but we do run into uh, we do have to reckon with the local community, which which has kind of adopts that nationalist tone that you mentioned in your, um, you know, in your, in your talk. And so I just am, am always, you know, hopeful and kind of looking to, to build broader coalitions or, or to find these alternative perspectives and to humanize this issue, which is really, um, really one of major importance uh, for, uh, for our memory of the past and, and continues to have, you know, real relevance to um, you know, how we talk about the past today. So th thank you for that uh, question, uh, Robert, as well as the additional comments and uh, uh, good luck with those uh, challenges of uh, uh, integrating this global history into to local history here in the Northwest. So I think we have time for um, at least uh, one more question uh, and uh, um, Professor Kawamura, uh, we've had a little bit of uh, audio trouble on your end, so I don't know if your uh, microphone is uh, maybe a little bit loose, uh, the connection, or we were get, just getting some static that was uh, uh, covering uh, some of your response to that last question. Um, but uh, if uh, someone else would like to um, uh, offer a question, or if, if not, uh, I, I could uh, pose one. So I, I'm a historian of the media and a former journalist, and I'm curious about how uh, newspapers in Japan uh, would have covered both the bombing of Pearl Harbor uh, and uh, the atomic bombings uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, in the course of your research, did you look at the, any sort of comparative press coverage of uh, the, the two events at the beginning of the war? or uh, is there a, another study that uh, might uh, address uh, some of those questions? Um, can you hear me? Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, when that, when Japan attacked uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, it was a secret, you know, plan. It was a surprise attack. So Japanese uh, people or Japanese public had no idea they were all caught by surprise. And even the government officials didn't know about it except for the minister. So this was a total surprise and even Japanese people were surprised. And so that, and so the, the day that the, you know, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, it was of course the big news in Japan, of course, because Japan went to war with the United States. I mean, that's all that the Japanese government wanted the people to know. And they had a tight censorship of uh, news media. So that's all Japanese people learned about it. And of course, they went to war for self-defense. Uh, that's how they saw it, because they, the Americans were trying to strangle Japan to uh, 
pushed down to the third rate nation or something, and Japan's immediately was defending Japan. That, that's the rhetoric that they used, and they wanted Japanese people to believe that. And so that's the news coverage. There's nothing, not much else to read in it. And so, but at the end of the year war, toward the end of the war, of course, Japan still had a very tight censorship and the public information was controlled by the military to you know, basically mobilize, keep the um, Japanese people's efforts to keep fighting war. But uh, so atomic bomb, when it was dropped, uh, the next day there was this little newspaper article uh, saying the new type of bomb was dropped over Hiroshima. That's all. The, the word atomic bomb was never used. And of course, they had to confirm it anyway. Uh, so immediately was sent there to investigate. But the, and then of course, the news came that President Truman publicly declared that the US used the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and it, it's going to be it's going to continue the reign of ruin, right? And then Nagasaki. So US news came to Japan and it was trans I mean, uh, reported secondhand. Once US occupied Japan, atomic bomb related information was all censored. So nothing was to be said about the atomic bomb. And that continued for more than uh, a decade. And, um, but then little by little, like John Hersey's book came out in the US. And so the Japanese actually learned through American news media to learn about the atomic bomb. And of course, US military was very slow to release all those images. So. so. We, we have a comment in the chat from uh, Charlotte, uh, who uh, observes, uh, I think there's a high school in the Tri-Cities that has a mascot or symbol that celebrates the atomic bomb. And I believe that's the Richland High School Bombers, uh, which has uh, or used to have a mushroom cloud uh, logo. And uh, Charlotte says that when she wrote a letter to the editor, regarding it, some people minimize the effect of the atomic bomb. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, curious, uh, um, Professor, whether uh, you've been to Richland High School, uh, have you ever been asked to speak uh, about uh, this topic there or uh, whether uh, any place, uh, perhaps the WSU Tri-Cities campus uh, uh, might provide a forum for a, a conversation about some of these issues? No, I was never contacted by them, but I knew Mushroom Cloud was the mascot of the high school. Uh, but no, I've not done anything. Well, uh, I think that there may be a, an opportunity, perhaps as we, we move uh, further in time uh, away from the events of World War II, that uh, perhaps uh, uh, people might be more receptive to uh, acknowledging and the potential harm of, of those symbols uh, and uh, that uh, there might be some um, receptivity to, to changing it. Uh, uh, Robert is noting uh, that it's called the R cloud, uh, a mushroom cloud over a capital R for, for Richland. So um, I, I'm not seeing uh, any other uh, uh, questions or comments in the chat. So I think we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, I'd like uh, if uh, the audience would be willing to uh, turn on your cameras and uh, uh, give our, our guest a, a virtual round of uh, applause or uh, either a, a hand up in the, the Zoom conversation. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kawamura for an informative presentation. And uh, I hope that uh, regular attendees of the Renfrew Colloquium will uh, join us on Thursday, 12.30, uh, the usual Zoom meeting for a preview of the Idaho Vock Festival. And then uh, again, uh, next Tuesday uh, for a presentation about the Trans-Antarctic Expedition of uh, Edmund Hillary. So uh, both of those should be uh, informative and uh, entertaining. So. Uh, again, uh, thank you all for joining us today. 
uh, stay safe and uh, we'll see you on Zoom later this week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.